Uh, first and foremost, I'm Ross. A little bit about me. I've been teaching English for over 12 years and English itself for a good solid 10, 10 and a half years and then a little bit more after that uh, for other subjects. Um, I did my special double major in philosophy and psychology at York, which is just a fancy way of saying I know how to write a lot. Um, and that's basically why I took that degree, because there is an obscene amount of writing. Uh, at this point now, I've got well over 300 essays under my belt. And if I include uh, you guys in that count, I am in, I, I, I can't even count how many essays I have uh, written or helped write with other people. Um, my hobbies include video games and my favorite food is pizza. Okay. Um, so we'll start from here. You have various parts of speech. These are really important to keep in mind. Um, and if someone raises their hand right now, I can't see anything. So please let me know. Hopefully a pop-up shows up. But here, when I say what part of speech something is, these are the things I'm usually talking about. Nouns, pronouns, adjectives, adverbs, verbs, prepositions, conjunctions, interjections, but these are not just single words. Sometimes you can have a phrase, so a couple of words, or you can even have a clause, um, which is either an independent or dependent sentence. Usually a clause doesn't have end punctuation just yet. We'll talk about the little parts of speech, uh, but knowing your parts of speech, really important stuff. Very helpful as well. Because um, if I am asking you, oh, are you using a word as an adjective or are you using this word as a noun or a verb? So take, for example, the word innocent or innocence. Am I using it as a noun, as an adjective, or am I using it um, as something else? Uh, okay, uh, so parts of speech, very important to keep in mind. Some of the times we will focus just on this. This is all part of grammar, and we'll take a look at that. Uh, we don't need this. So, And then we also talk about things like sentence structure or structure of summary writing, paragraph writing, and then essay writing. Uh, and of course, in that period, we also take a look at things like news articles, journals, um, try and do narrative writing or personal narratives. Those are two different things, but at the same time, they're almost the same. We'll, we will discuss how they are the same and how they are different. Uh, here we see the basic order of words in a sentence, how we sort of should follow through. We always need some kind of subject and a verb to make our bare, basic, tiniest sentence. The smallest possible complete sentence you could make is two words long, a noun and a verb. You have to have the thing, the person, place, or thing, the noun, that does or is something, and then the verb. So dogs bark. Well, that's a full and complete sentence, technically, because it's the subject being dogs. And what are we saying about dogs? They bark. Well, you've got your verb. After you do your subjects and your verbs, you have to have some kind of objects, the what of the sentence, what are we performing the action on? Does anyone remember or know what an indirect object is? It's usually the thing that receives of the action. So we perform the action on something, and then there is usually someone or something else that is affected because we have done the action. I threw the ball to Ted. Ted becomes the indirect object. He gets the ball, but I did the action. I did the action to the ball. The ball ends up in Ted's hands, but he, I did not throw Ted. So Ted can't be thrown. Well, I mean, if I'm strong enough, but the ball is thrown. And then the manner that we do something, we start to describe the verb using an adverb. Uh, and then usually we can include places, times, locations, all this kind of stuff. Pretty important, rather useful. And then other things that we'll keep in mind, like uh, verb tenses. And this is just one of my favorite charts to show how confusing our verb tenses can be. Uh, just a show of hands, or you can uh, let me know right away. Who can tell me how many verb 
tenses do we have in the English language? Too many is correct, but does anyone know a number? Go ahead and you can just put your hand up and let me know or shout it out. Either one works. So we've got our basic past, present, and future. So that's three. And then there are four sort of types that we break that down into, making a total of 12 tenses. Why do we need that? English is a little evil that way. We have your simple tense and then your past, present, and future of that. You've got your continuous or progressive tense and then the past, present, and future of those. And then you've got your perfect tense indicating that something is done. And then your past, present, future of those. And then you've got a mix of continuous slash progressive and perfect. So perfect, continuous, or progressive perfect. Uh, and I hopefully will not confuse you more than you need to be uh, when we discuss our tenses. Um, this is just a brief example of what an essay would look like, the number of paragraphs you would use, the uh, type of focus that you would develop, or how you should start with your broadest point when you introduce a subject and you should be narrowing things down before you get to the main meat, the body of your paragraph. Uh, I'll show you pictures of a hamburger just to really uh, show you uh, how we can think of sentence structure and paragraph structure and essay structure as food, because I really like food. So I think that's the easiest way to compare things. Um, of course, a lot of you play tennis and badminton, so I may see if there's a way that I can do that as well, because uh, I really like to make sure that if you have something to compare, then it's easier to remember, it's easier to understand. And then we have various things. So we will do a lot of storytelling. This is an important thing to get used to, especially from grades three to about six, almost seven. There are various types of stories. We have your traditional narrative, where there is some voice, somebody telling a story, whether it's you, a character in the story, a character that watches the story and tells it to us, the audience. There are various things about a story, like elements that we need to know. So what we see in front of us here, hopefully you see the whole thing, um, the three little pigs. Does anyone know the story of the three little pigs? Anybody want to summarize that for us? I see Oliver's hand up. Go ahead, Oliver. Tell us about the three little pigs. We like the um, three pigs uh, with a bad wolf, and um, the uh, one pig wants to build a house with straw, and one with wood, and last one with bricks. And that big bad wolf just blow the um, straw house um, down, and also the wood house. The two, um, the two pigs that live in the straw house and wool house, um, like run to the bricks house pig and said, "Let me in." And the wolf thinks that the brick house can be blown down like the two, two other houses before. So he broke blow the house, and he tried lots. Lots of time, but he failed and he just fainted on the ground. <laughs> okay, poor wolf. Yeah, so you gave us a good little summary of the three little pigs. We'll take a look at some fairy tales. You guys are going to write your own versions of some fairy tales. We're going to do some summary writing. What Oliver gave us there was a summary. And writing summaries can be sometimes a little challenging because you don't know how much to tell or what you should tell. Uh, what we have here is an example of what's known as Freytag's Pyramid or the story plot line. Almost looks like a bit of a heartbeat where we have the start of the story, everything that happens, the highest peak, so almost the end or almost like the moment where, oh, wow, they're going to solve the problem, but they don't. And then eventually in the following action where they do, and then the resolution where things, the denouement, where things finish the end. And you can start a new story from there if you want. We will all be choosing various stories and summarizing these stories. Of course, when we do um, 
any kind of storytelling, be it an actual fairy tale or a fictional story, sometimes we have our own uh, personal stories to tell. So narratives, like what did you do over the summer? Well, that would be a personal narrative of sorts. You're telling the story of what happened over your summer. We have to consider various points of view. So first, second, and third. We typically focus on first and third person. Second person is, uh, it's in a weird place. But here we have a sort of uh, visual of the various types and points of view. So first person from your point of view, notice how those hands, those are now your hands. When you tell a story, everything is I, me, myself, and we. Uh, so does anyone know a story that's told from first person? Anybody can think of one right off the top of their heads. So what we have on the example here is Moby Dick, which uh, is a story about a, a man that joins a fishing boat or goes on a fishing boat to hunt down a giant, uh, I believe it's a great white whale or something along those lines. Um, maybe it's a humpback whale. Don't quite remember. So Moby Dick uh, starts right away with Call Me Ishmael, um, which is uh, just the narrator. The narrator actually happens to be the main character. But third person, we get all over the place. So Harry Potter, um, Percy Jackson, The Hunger Games, uh, Charlotte's Web comes to mind, uh, The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn, um, uh, third person, quite easy because there is a person in the background staring and watching. So our uh, creepy little waiter there is from the third point of view. Your third person narrator doesn't always have to be in the story. They could just be a disembodied entity watching and telling us, the audience, the story. We'll talk about the various levels that uh, happen when you do some writing in, in narrative, um, depending on the type of narrative. Okay, so that ends the picture.